and welcome to another edition of Broad Mind, where we explore the minds of writers, authors, and beyond. Today's guest is a Windsor resident, and her name is Beth Caruso. Um, I want to go over her bio first of all, and that is uh, Beth holds a master's degree in nursing and public health. She had the honor of working with Karen Hill Tribes as a Peace Corps volunteer in Thailand. She also had the privilege to care for hundreds of babies and their mothers as a labor and delivery nurse. She gained extensive knowledge and a deep love for plants through an apprenticeship with herbalist and wild crafter Will Endress in North Carolina. She has continued to surround herself with plants through gardening and native species conservation. Her latest passion is to discover and convey important stories of women in American history. I must thank Beth Caruso for being on our show. Hi, Beth. Hi, thank you so much for having me. You're welcome. Very happy to be here. Very good. Um, I have to ask you, when did you start writing? Like at what age did you find your passion? Um, this is more recent, actually. The story itself is something that led me to start writing. I had always toyed with the idea of writing historical fiction, mm. but I hadn't actually done it. But then when I discovered the story about Alice Young, which is what we're talking about today, the first, first woman hung in the New World for witchcraft, wow. I felt responsible. I felt like I had to tell the story and Windsor needed to know about it and the rest of the world needed to know about it. Wow. Um, considering you have a love of plants and, and you've, you've done all the work with Peace Corps, um, what made you switch gears to women in American history? I mean, like, how did you get started in discovering? Well, this? again, it was this specific story. Someone told me about Alice Young and they told me she was here in Windsor and the very first person hung for witchcraft. And that just amazed me because everyone I had heard about who had been hung for witchcraft in colonial times had been from Salem. Since then, I've discovered that there have been a lot of um, others in Connecticut, but that she was the very, very first one and nobody was talking about her and nobody knew her story really startled me, intrigued me, amazed me. So I set off on a quest to find out more about her. And what I found out was shocking and I decided sure, yeah. to write it. But the research actually took about a year. I started in April of 2013 and I didn't start writing until August of last year, 2014. Mm -hmm. So the process was basically looking at different maps. If you look online, you're not going to find anything much about Alice Young. No, I, I couldn't find it. I couldn't find much even in no. researching. The, the, only, the only record about her, or records about her, John Winthrop Diaries mm. noted that one blank of Windsor was hung in 1647. Mm. It wasn't until the late 1800s when James Hammond Trumbull discovered on the inside cover of the Matthew Grant diary, Alice Young was hanged with the exact same date, and that matched. Um, that was really the only information we had about her, and that she may have been married to a man named John Young. We knew John L Young lived on Backer Row, so that's where I started. Hmm. Really interesting. Um, Usually when we think of, of like uh, witches or, or witchcraft, we, we tend to think of like a Halloween type of um, stereotype, you know, with witches with the big black pointy hats and everything. But um, in this case, can you really explain what witchcraft is and why she was executed? Well, back in those days, they thought witchcraft was being in line with um, demons or the devil. They, they were so afraid of that. And they had no theories really that were scientifically based to 
explain disease and to explain a lot of other things. Mm. So if they couldn't explain something, they would often scapegoat somebody. For example, if diseases went crazy in the community and people were dying, they would think of it as Satan making inroads into their community because mm. they they were scared and they had no explanation. And this was a common, common belief that there were witches among them. It's very different than the religion of Wicca today, which is basically mm. a nature-based religion. What I'm talking about in the book, even though there is a lot of uh, nature and plants and herbalism in the book, it's really more about the fear of the time and the, the, the cultural way that people interpreted that fear. Hmm. Interesting. And I'm, I'm just saying to myself, well, considering that you're, you're from Windsor and everything, and this is part of its history, um, there's a name that, that always pops up within our, our own history, and that's Amy Duggan Archer Gilligan, which is was the uh, catalyst for arsenic in all ways. So I'm wondering, why is it that Alice Young's story hasn't been known? It's very interesting, and I have my theories about it. I think Alice was connected to a larger family. When I did my research on Backer Row, I discovered that she was connected to one sister on one lot, another sister, then another sister sold her the next lot, then there was another sister. Mm -hmm. So I put together a family tree of these people and lo and behold, their brother was someone very um, famous in the colony. He was the assistant to John Winthrop Jr. Mm -hmm. And he had also worked for John Winthrop Sr. So they were a minority group within this community. You hear about the settlers from the Mary and John, mm -hmm. and you hear about the Stiles group that settled a little bit north, but you've never heard about this small group, which is interesting because the town that they were from mm -hmm. in England was Windsor. Oh. <laughs> so there was something going on politically yeah. that I think, and maybe it was a historical cover-up of sorts. You also hear about, oh, well, the records just weren't there. Mm. Well, when I hear that, I think of, oh, was there a fire to the building? Did it burn down? Did something like that happen? But in this case, that's not true. Mm. If you go back to the early records for the uh, court for the uh, colony of Connecticut, mm -hmm. you discover all kinds of records the same month that she was hung. Wow almost every day. The court was in session, pages after pages, yet her story is missing. Wow. So what that tells me is the story was probably, the records were probably cherry-picked out of there. Hmm. Maybe later on by a family member of somebody who was on the opposite side who felt it was embarrassing when people started not believing in witches anymore. Well, um, along the lines of, of what you're talking about, like the, the sisters and brothers, how did you research the genealogy? Um, a whole variety of different ways. I went to Ancestry.com, but you do oh. have to be careful with um, genealogical records mm -hmm. because people will copy over and over and the information isn't always accurate. So whatever information I had, I tried to verify it with historical documents, mostly primary sources, whenever I could. So it's not like something you can go to the library and like you were saying, where Ancestry.com kind of turns into a little bit of a Wikipedia situation. So you probably had to do a lot of research on a, this. A ton of research. Also, I looked at um, New England Genealogical Society, that was very helpful. Wow. A lot of resources. And also there's a lot of very old books online now that you can get for free, um, such as um, the records for the court, for the um, 
colony of Connecticut. You can get those online. You can get the early styles books, um, one of Windsor's foremost historians. If you go to Google Books and go to Google Play, you can download those. So there's actually more than ever, there is so much information available to people on their computers. Even the Matthew Grant Diary, which was a critical piece of information that helped me to figure out what was going on, is online. And one of our Windsor residents mm -hmm. helped to push and get that online, actually, um, Ms. Liz McCullough. Yeah. Did you have any opposition or difficulties in, in trying to get this the story out or like did anybody tell you you can't do this it's too dark and we don't want this on in Windsor's pages so to say um well I didn't know if that would happen or not and I knew how critical the story was and how important it was it's very different it was at least important to me I think it's a very critical part of Windsor's history and so initially I pretty much kept it to myself mm. I had um, look. I had some local friends read it, who were they were blown away because all these names that they had heard before were coming to life. Wow. Um, and I also wanted it to be authentic historically. It, it is a piece of historical fiction, but mm -hmm. I wanted the customs, the beliefs, to be very authentic. So I had the head of the department, um, Catherine Hermes, at um, the history chair at Connecticut Central, uh, at CCSU, Connecticut Central State University, look at it. I also had Lisa Johnson look at it, who runs the Stanley Whitman Museum, and wow. they have the largest archives of witchcraft accusations and trials wow. in the state. So I went about it carefully at the same time as I, you know, kept it close mm -hmm. to me and mm -hmm. and had them just look at it for authenticity. Wow. So it's more like fact-based fiction. Yes, it's mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. based on this real family and real events that happened in their lives. I think the family fractured with this event. And I I feel, at least I, I know in my heart, that they were connected to Alice. And the historical records do show that. Mm -hmm. Because after her hanging, they kind of split from the town. Mm -hmm. And they scattered in many different directions. Wow. Um, I, I did some research myself, just a little bit, like Wikipedia and whatnot. And um, I couldn't help but notice that this isn't just a Windsor thing. This is expands out to Hartford because where the execution took place was at the Meeting House Square, which we now know as the Old State House. Yes. So yes. you're really delving into a piece of history that's more broad than just one town. It's definitely more broad, not in only that she probably would have gone by shallop, which was what they called the boats in those days. Mm -hmm to Hartford to be hung. I think the um, center of the court was at Hartford and that's why she went there. Um, but it's so much far, farther reaching than just that. Yeah. Because of her connections with her family, and, and this can be proven historically, she was connected to this man who was the assistant to Governor John Winthrop Jr. He was pivotal in stopping all the witchcraft hangings and accusations in Connecticut. Hmm. Did this man tell him the story of Alice because it was part of his family? It, it may have been an influence to that. Hmm. The other interesting part of it, in the opposite direction, and this is where the family splintering comes in, there was somebody in that family who was so affected dramatically by the events that led to her hanging. Later in life, he became a minister. Wow. And the crazy thing is, you find him retired in Cotton Mather's church in Boston at the same time as 
the Salem witch trials. Wow. He would have been an older minister, about 87 years old. And you know, the older you were, the more revered you were. Cotton Mather was only in his 20s at the time. So he would have looked up to this man and he was writing Wonders of the Invisible World at the time, <laughs> which was the document that made the witchcraft trials spread like wildfire from Salem to all these other towns in the surrounding areas. <laughs> and this same man is found in relation to one of these witchcraft scenes mm -hmm. with a victim. So I think there is a likelihood, at least a possibility, that this man from Windsor mm -hmm. in 1647 had an influence on the witchcraft trials and accusations that went beyond Salem. So because of knowing all this is why I've been so passionate about getting this out. Mm -hmm. I think it's such an important story from that perspective, but it's also an important story in that it's really been there all along. Yeah. The women were ignored behind the men on back a row. If somebody had bothered to look at who these women were, this story would have been out well over a hundred years ago. Wow. Was there a particular way you built the story? By July, August of last year, 2014, my head was just exploding with all this information. Mm. I had enough uh, rough outline of what I wanted to do. And um, luckily, I have a good friend, uh, Susan Aspley, who was my friend in Peace Corps, who, interestingly enough, checked my uh, writing as I was applying to graduate school. <laughs> so I told her this story and she said, you have to get it out. You have to get it out. She is a writer herself, mm -hmm. um, has written some wonderful books and she coached me and she said, just write 250 words a day. It doesn't have to be great. Fit it into your outline somewhere and, and go by that. I said, I can do that. Wow. I can write 500 a day. And I marked it out on the calendar. Um, some of it was good. Some of it needed to be more in depth. Anyway, I kept going until March. I was wow. finished. Wow. And then from March until very recently, wow. it's been revising and rewriting and yeah. getting more in depth. Um, that's that's another thing I, I find really really interesting about authors who write about time-based pieces mm -hmm. and um, you wrote about 1647 yeah and I I read some of the uh, manuscript and I'm I'm blown away because I I have no idea I mean I, I write about like kind of modern fiction right in a way and uh, it's really intriguing because the way you take the reader into that world and I'm wondering how how do you actually manage to tap into that I mean seeing as though you didn't live during that time did it, does it have to do with the, the research or a lot of that, it has to do with the research yeah. nothing drives me crazier than reading historical fiction and the food is not authentic the clothes are not authentic even when they gathered food is not authentic so I wanted people to feel like they could go back in time and they could really see what was going on. Okay. Um, you brought a very interesting piece with you, and that is your manuscript. Yes. Um, it's about 300 pages, includes uh, maps and everything, which will be part of the, the uh, final draft and everything, and the regular traditional size book and everything. Yes, we uh, have seven maps in the book. Wow. There's a forward and then there's an author's note at the back, which mm -hmm. helps the reader to understand what is true and what did I make up. Wow. And the things that I made up, a lot of them were made up from educated guesses from all the research. Wow. Uh, my final question I have to ask you for today is how do you plan on marketing this novel? I mean, is it something where you take it to 
which museums or just historical societies? What, what is it that you're looking for as, as a platform? Well, I, I will take it to those places for sure. That will be a part of it. Um, I am selling it online on Amazon. I plan to talk to book bloggers, a whole array. I mean, a lot of this I've been taking one step at a time. Marketing is not my background. Yeah. So I'm making dry calls to reporters. Wow. I've managed to get um, two articles mm -hmm. that will be coming out soon. Oh, what, what I want to convey to people though is this is not just a Halloween story. Mm -hmm. This is a very significant story. Historical. About early 1600s colonial settlement in Connecticut mm -hmm. and beyond. Mm -hmm. So, and it's a, it, it, there are layers of mystery and there are layers of things that you wouldn't expect in the book either. Yeah. It's not a straightforward witch hanging. No. Not at all. Um, do you have a, a website? I do. If you go to www.oneofwindsor.com, I have a whole website. It lists um, all the appearances that I'm going to do. I would like to do a lot of talks with the maps mm -hmm. to explain to people how a lot of what was unknown mm -hmm. is now known. I actually did a presentation of the maps with my husband, who's a geographer, wow. at um, Nestfall, which is the New England Geographical Conference, mm -hmm. and, Saint, and also St. Lawrence Valley Conference. We presented all the maps, and it was interesting because one map, the first map mm -hmm. of Backer Row, led to another map which was the property of the esteemed brother or the famous brother. Um, by looking at a map, you find out so, so much. So that's a big part of what I want to do is actually do presentations for people, not just with the maps. There's a lot of herbal medicine from yeah. that time. Yeah. I use manuscripts from the 1600s too. Wow. Um, and it's very interesting stuff. I would love to present that as well, if anyone is interested in that. Wow. Um, we've, we've unfortunately run out of time, but um, I would like to thank you for, for, for being on the, on the show. Thank you. I've enjoyed it. It's, it's, it's been an honor for me, uh, being a Windsor resident and everything. Um, I have a, a copy, believe it or not, of your uh, book here. It is one of Windsor, The Untold Story of America's First Witch Hanging, and it will be available. If you check on my website, www.oneofwindsor.com, it'll tell you when it's available. If it's available, it'll give you a direct link to Amazon. I will also be selling it at your wonderful book fair, which you might want to talk more about. <laughs> That's right, Beth. We do have a book fair coming up. It is the Broadmind Book Fair to benefit Win TV, our most beloved TV station in all of Windsor. There will be a dozen authors on hand for signings and you can talk to them about the process of writing just like what we do here on the show. We'll also have an excellent sign auction featuring about 30 different items and all this will take place November 7th at the Windsor Historical Society from 11 to 4. The Historical Society, of course, is at 96 Palisado Avenue. I want to thank you for being on the show, Beth, and uh, I wish you tons of luck on this One of Windsor, The Untold Story of America's First Witch Hanging, which will be available starting next week. And I want to send out a special, uh, special shout out to Joe and Liz McAuliffe. Thank you for tuning in to Broad Mind. I'm your host, T.L. Rockwitz. Until then. <laughs>